Okay, guys, we're going to go ahead and get started. Um, thank you all for attending our uh, very first virtual art salon. We're um, going to do this every week. We're super excited about it. We're going to meet uh, via Zoom webinar. Um, we have the links. They'll be on the website. You guys can register. And then um, you should receive an email an hour before the event. Um, and from that email, you can join uh, the webinar. It should be pretty straightforward. Um, we, again, like I said, we're gonna do this every Tuesday at four o'clock. This week, we have our very own Leah sharing her work. Um, next week, Lou is gonna share her work and um, so on and so on. So we have a really good lineup full of our amazing artistic staff that's gonna share their work um, to you guys, our ranch community. Um, I do want to let you guys know that we are recording the webinar, so that way we can post it to our social media and website. So if you are unable to event to watch the event, you can um, view it later on one of those two platforms. Um, we are going to take questions. Um, if you were in our last Zoom meeting, it was a little bit different. Uh, if you look at the bottom of the Zoom window, there's a Q&A button, and that's how we're gonna take questions uh, for this particular event. So when Leah's finished sharing her work, if you guys will go ahead and type in your question, and I'll read it to her, and then she can answer, um, and we'll just kind of go forward from there. So make sure that you guys um, can have your questions ready, and type them in the Q&A, and then um, we will get those to Leah. Um, I also wanna mention that we do, um, we do have our Thinker Thursday. We're taking that virtual as well, and we're going to be doing that on Thursday. So make sure that you see the website for the registration link, um, and it'll be the same platform. Um, and it should be really exciting. We've got some uh, cool people lined up for that as well. Um, so I'm going to go ahead where I'm going to introduce Leah, and then I'm going to turn it over to her. Just like last time, if you guys were um, on that meeting, the best way to view, um, Leah's gonna be sharing her screen and the best way to see what she's sharing is to be on the speaker view, which is located at the top um, right. There should be some viewing icons. And if you're in gallery view, you can see both Leah and I, but if you are in speaker view, the person who is speaking takes the most real estate on your screen. And that way you can see the work that she's showing um, via her computer. So um, Leah, who um, is, hopefully you guys can see her in the panel. Um, Leah is an artist working primarily in object-based sculpture, furniture, and installation. She grew up in Seattle, Washington and received her BFA in sculpture from Rhode Island School of Design in 2017. She's lived in the Roaring Fork Valley since graduating and was an artist in residence at Elsewhere Studios. And she's shown work for all over the country and she is currently our digital fabrication technician here at Anderson Ranch. So I will go ahead um, and turn it over to, Le to Leah. I'm gonna mute myself and you guys can um, give her all ears. Okay, thanks Esther. <clears throat> Thank you everyone for joining in today. Um, today I'm gonna show a bunch of different work from the last five years that mostly centers around the motif of the grid. I wanna share work that's both uh, finished and work that isn't part of any polished portfolio because a lot of the time when I'm making, um, my, my time doesn't produce any finished product. Um, and I've come to really value it, those kind of throwaway experiments as contributions to where I am in my practice now. Um, every failed study is like an attempt to get an idea out and really allows me to either move on from that idea or prompt something much more interesting. So I studied sculpture at RISD, like Esther said, and um, my faculty really drove home the idea that material plus um, form equals concept and meaning. And this is a rule that I've followed at varying levels of devotion um, at different points in my career. But I do always come back to that um, and remind myself to create with that in mind. So you can look kind of look at my work with that in mind as well. Um, from the beginning of my RISD education, I think I was really making with a feminist agenda. I was trying to understand my role as a woman making art and was attempting to situate myself within the canon of feminist sculptors. Um, I was using the body, my body, and other femme bodies a lot in my work, 
and kind of looking at abstracting them in various ways to portray concept. Um, I was and continue to be really inspired by the literature that I was reading at the time, um, primarily fiction. Um, and so this piece is called This is Just a Simulation. And I made it right after I'd read the short story The Yellow Wallpaper by Charlotte Perkins Gilman, which is about a female narrator's descent into hysteria. This is a three-channel video installation where my character moves in and out of the two side screens um, and spends time in this center screen that's kind of further abstracted um, by the, the curve and the form, kind of as a representation of a liminal zone. This next piece follows pretty similar themes of liminal physical and emotional space, um, as well as thinks about isolation within a collective experience. I was thinking a lot about the relationship um, of a woman's body to domestic surfaces such as tiles um, found in the bathroom or the kitchen. And this was a live performance that I did for a critique or that my performers did for a critique. Um, and they were in these, I call them body bags at this point, um, for about 30 minutes. And um, a lot of condensation built up during that time, which I thought was kind of an interesting element of the piece because I associate tile um, as being a really cold material and to see the transition of it covered in, in sweat and condensation um, was really interesting to me. Um, I felt like this piece was very, very successful, but kind of after it, I started to feel strange about my use of the female body in my work. I kind of felt like I was exploiting it in a way um, maybe in order to evoke an emotional response from my viewer. Um, and so although I was still really interested in creating bodily things, I wanted to transition the work to be a little bit more abstract and a little less obvious conceptually. So here's one of those experiments that I was talking at, about at the beginning um, that turned into a really important moment um, in my education. So I was going to make a mold of these tiles and I had an in-progress critique right after I poured the rubber on top of the tiles and my whole class told me to just stop right there and consider this a work in and of itself. I did eventually peel off the rubber and create this kind of tile puddle um, within a larger installation, but that moment of pausing um, it has been proved to be a really um, important moment in my my artistic career. I think um, I kind of saw it as a, a moment of accidental sculpture. Um, and it led to, like, the, the sculpture kind of captured this candid moment that led to a narrative that was unknown to me. Up until that point, I'd been really concerned with creating a narrative first and then a sculpture that would depict that narrative. Um, but at this point, I transitioned into making objects that could have belonged to a similar universe or fiction that was still a mystery to me. Um, and then trying to kind of decipher that narrative after I had made something. So I started to create a series of objects that I felt into, felt fit into this kind of confused domestic space. And I was doing things like upholstering sheets of rubber onto crappy plywood forms and then stuffing them with cotton balls. And these sculptures uh, really referenced furniture but were totally non-functional and kind of sad. Um, and eventually I needed to put these objects into some sort of configuration. So I decided to tape a grid, you can kind of see in this image, here's the installation shot. I decided to tape a grid into the corner of my critique space, um, my department's critique space. Um, and respond to the architecture of the room so that the, uh, the grid kind of ripples away from the column there. <clears throat> and uh, the grid was really piggybacking off of the motif of tiles, but sparked more ambiguity for me than the tile pattern. Um, this, I mean, it was a pretty large installation and stepping into this gridded space felt like crossing some sort of threshold into an alternate reality that these objects belong to. And at the time I was going through some personal identity issues and I kind of came to look at the grid as a sort of blank canvas on which chaos could take form. 
the grid was a really neutral environment for my confusion and helped me to organize my thoughts and organize the objects that I was making at the time. This what these are just a few other objects within this. Um, this was one of the first installations where I felt like I successfully built an environment that was outside of our own reality, which was uh, has continued to be a goal of mine. Um, so I spent a lot of time in the grid and decided to include a representation of myself within the space, kind of reiterating the mo motif of the grid over and over again um, through the forms that I was placing inside of it. Um, so this is that photo, just kind of a representation of my emotional space when I was inside of my installation. Um, all right, so here are just a few more uh, objects that did not make the cut into that installation, um, but I, that I still think about a lot. So these blocks I have kind of called belly button blocks, um, and I've used them iteratively, um, and I still have them and think about them a lot, uh, but they're an example of something that's never made it into like a polished piece of mine. So I did a few more of these grid installations before moving on. In this one, I had visited a friend who was studying abroad in Rome and we taped a, the grid onto her whole studio space. It was a fairly small studio. Um, and in the end, uh, like the, the resulting work from this was a series of photographs of us activating um, the space with our bodies. Again, just kind of like a, an emo a representation of the emotions that I was feeling when I was in that space. And we made one more when we came back to RISD. And this was just a little piece of that. So the grid in the larger space that had such a strong impact for me and I was really attracted to the way that such a simple gesture um, could transform a space so significantly. And I wanted to make something that would retain that immersiveness, but be a little bit more intimate. So I created a large wooden object that housed this interior. And it really was an attempt to distill aspects of architecture that I had seen out and outside. Um, and it was a space for two people. So this is the outside of that object. Um, and this uh, and with people interacting with it. And this piece taught me a lot about woodworking and building, but I think fell short concept conceptually. Um, it was a little bit too abstract and clean and didn't have enough of a human touch for me. And this is another iteration of that same piece, just cut apart and reassembled. All right, so at the end of my senior year, I was invited to participate in a group exhibition at the RISD Museum, um, the student curated gallery of the RISD Museum. And the exhibition was called Mutual Encounters and participants had to pair up um, and create a collaborative work that talked about a women's issue. And all of the, um, the participants were uh, female identifying. So I collaborated with my best friend Gia who was studying graphic design. Um, and I was still really in the mindset of, of like creating something and just kind of thinking about the narrative or the concept later, um, which really rivaled the way that Gia thinks as a designer. So it was a good pairing because we kind of pushed each other to um, be a little bit flexible. Um, so I made this object to begin with, really just thinking about pattern and sculptural furniture. And here is a little process shot. And then Gia designed this object in the forefront and we built it together. So they're both made out of wood and then painted. Um, and in the end, we decided that these objects needed some sort of interaction because although they were um, hard and wooden, the forms were really playful. So for the opening of the exhibition, we did a performance in which we created a series of moves um, with the objects and then kind of just repeated them in a circle for two hours. And we hoped, the, the, kind of the thought behind this was to draw attention to how we as women are often um, made to engage in social dynamics of giving and softening and tolerating um, another move from that 
performance. And by the end, like we had bruises on our ribs from leaning over this object. And, um, and this remains one of my favorite pieces because it's not something that I would have made on my own, which I think is always exciting to bring into your practice. Um, and it's, it was like a good compromise of like having to decide on a concept and getting some free reign. All right, I'm gonna jump way ahead here to when I was an intern at Anderson Ranch. So after graduating in 2017, I came to the ranch and started making work. Um, I, being out of school was, uh, brought me some frustration in making, but it also helped me to think through process, slow it down and kind of try a bunch of new techniques um, that the ranch had to offer. So now at this point, instead of taking a few weeks to make a sculpture, like in school, it was taking me a few months. And um, I started to, to pick up some more labor intensive processes, which gave me a lot of time to think about the sculptures as I was making them. Um, in my senior year of college, I had been reading a lot of magical realism and making a lot of work with tongues. Um, and that all continued at the ranch. The tongue had kind of come to represent uh, disembodied sexuality for me, female sexuality, um, and I was making a bunch of different versions of them that were really cartoonish. So during a bronze casting class that I assisted that summer, the teacher, David Kimball Anderson, who uh, encouraged me to make something along with the students, which was super awesome. Um, so I made all of these wax tongues, which eventually we cast in bronze in the workshop. Um, and I made it them just because I wanted to. I had no intention for them um, and that was okay. Um, no goal in mind. And I was doing a lot of that, just kind of reveling in the opportunity to make and try new processes. And then here's like one little dinky thing that I made with them. So I was also getting really into digital fabrication during my internship and learning what tools were at the ranch. And while I had been making those tongues, I had been making more grids. And so this is a, a grid made out of steel. Again, I had made it just because I wanted to and there was no, no end goal, but I kind of hoped that like during the hours I spent filing down the welds that uh, some sculpture would kind of come to me with all of these elements, which it eventually did. So I ended up taking a 3D scan of this, um, of this grid, which was semi-successful. And here's a, a screenshot um, of the, the grid in Rhino. Um, and I used the, the 3D scan and 3D modeling in the CNC to create a wooden element that would like slot perfectly into the grid like this. I'd found a lot of intimacy with the grid, of course, um, but I was slowly removing myself from that and wanted to create representations of intimacy that didn't involve myself. So this haptic engagement between the wood and the metal was much more subtle and tender um, than some of my other work had been. And also I was kind of thinking because I was in the digital fabrication headspace, like in Rhino, like a very simple command is to make like a, a shape and then extrude it. And so I kind of thought of this as, as an extrusion um, into the grid. Uh, but I couldn't resist view, like pulling in the viewer or like the human a little bit. So I inserted this door viewer into the wood. And when you looked inside, you saw the two bronze tongues that I had cast like the summer before. Um, so this work is still very influenced by magical realism and I was concerned with making objects or situations that I'd never seen before and which could pass in our reality but might not truly belong there. And they, you know, they could pass in our reality because they referenced architecture in the built world. Um, and I think that this piece has several levels of intimacy and interaction and through it I'm inviting the viewer to kind of change their perspective of what intimacy can be. Okay, so I just have one more piece to show you all. Um, last summer, I started another, just another series of grids. I thought that if I made enough of these, I would find something to do with them. 
Um, but they're mostly just a way to keep my hands busy. Like I could go work on them during my lunch break for 30 minutes or five minutes and get something done. Um, and at the same time that I was making these, I was uh, spending a lot of time on the computer 3D modeling, sketching in Rhino. And I was 3D modeling really similar form, uh, grid forms or attempting to. And just trying to manipulate them and figure out ways to turn them into sculptures. Basically just playing around on the computer with composition. Um, and because I was spending so much time on the computer, I started to think um, about a more conceptual role that digital fabrication can play in art making. I think I understood the parallels between my past larger installation, grid installations, and the grid of the seaplane, which you can see in one of these images in Rhino. Um, but I couldn't really bring myself to substitute the digital entirely for the physical. So I decided to create a challenge for myself. I would attempt to make entirely by hand what I could make on the computer. So basically I was challenging myself to try and make this object um, by hand. Um, in Rhino, the grid and structure is really critical to efficient modeling, but at the same time, there's no gravity or acts of physics in the workspace. And so it's really easy to 3D model objects that would be nearly impossible to output. Um, so that was a challenge and it kind of worked out. Um, so I took a few pieces of foam and coopered them and carved them, covered them in epoxy clay and made molds of them and then cast them in bronze. Um, and when I started the wood element of the sculpture, I realized that my challenge would fail um, partially. Like I could not make that curved thing that I had in the 3D model. Um, at least not the first time around or within the time constraints that I had. Um, but I adjusted my design a little bit and the end result was this sculpture. And here's like a profile view of it. Um, so this is really far removed from the digital workspace. And I understand that the digital may not be super present in this work, but I chose to create these two pieces as mirrors of each other in, in the hope that it would allude to the digital origin um, of the work. Because mirroring is something that's really easy to do in Rhino, um, but is really obviously difficult to do by hand. Um, so this piece contains like aspects of material fluidity and intimacy that I think the last piece um, had. But it's, and it's also a, an attempt to create something that I've never seen before. And I think that it really, in a way, belongs to the same universe as the work. So even though like it's taken me maybe like a year and a half, two years to create these two works, whereas in college I was making a bunch of objects within a few months um, that, that belonged to the same installation, um, it's, it's all contributing to some body of work. Um, and I think in, creating objects that I've never seen before. I have a lot of um, like technical craft challenges to work through, but really the drive behind it is, um, it is that it forces my fictions into the world. And by embracing the abstraction in the work, I'm really creating ambiguous objects that welcome multiple interpretations and allow the viewer to see what they need to see. Because I think that we all look for what we need to see in our work. And I think that that's the power of it. Um, so that's all I have for today. Thank you for listening. Ah, oh, thanks so much, Leah. Um, we can go ahead and start some qu answering some questions. Um, first off, um, this is probably, let's start with this one, but if you could explain maybe to some of our viewers who maybe don't know what Rhino is yeah, and sorry. like what kind of like what like I know what it is but I just I feel like it, it's it, like it's obviously a point of decision making for you and like what you can and cannot do and so maybe just explain a little bit of what it does um, and how it functions. Yeah so Rhino is a 3D modeling software so it basically allows you to create um, like a 3D shape uh, within a, a computer 
And you use this to create a form that you might take to output in a number of ways like 3D printing um, or the CNC router. Um, but uh, it's used in a ton of different industries, architecture, manufacturing, um, a lot of different design, um, design uh, jobs. But um, for me, I mean, it's also used a lot in art making and um, artists use it in all sorts of really interesting ways and you can learn how to use it at Anderson Ranch. Um, but for me, I use it like mostly as a sketching tool and I do output um, some of my models um, to the various di digital fabrication equipment, um, but that's not always the main focus of my use of this software. Cool. Um, so Deb asked how the models uh, were able to breathe in their body bags that you had placed them in. Oh, that's a great question. Um, I had like sewn them so that there was a flap and um, they kind of climbed in, but I had their their faces near the flap. So mm -hmm. like I, if they needed to, they could just like push it out. <clears throat> Oxygen is important. <laughs> <laughs> um, Jean asks, uh, you say we a great deal in your presentation. Is your artwork more of a collaboration creation than your own conception? Um, maybe I was just talking about the one collaborative piece um, that I did with my friend Gia, which was way back here. This piece. So this was a collaboration, but all the other work um, is individual. Okay. Um, what kind of wood are you using? This is also from Deb again. What, uh, what kind of wood are you using with the grid protrusions? Um, that is basswood. Basswood is still considered a hardwood, but it's really, it's pretty soft for a hardwood, so it's quite nice to carve. Mm. Um, what is the material of the stalks in the last piece? I think the ones from the pear show. Oh yeah, that's the same. Same wood. Sorry, maybe I wasn't was confused about what they were talking about before. Well, those are two different questions. Back. Sorry. So this is basswood. The other grid piece is also basswood. Got it. Cool. Um, Andrea would like to know if you could talk more about how you feel your initial interest in the body and feminism continues as you explore more abstract objects. Sure. I think that. Um, even though the, these are not representations of the body, that they still have a really bodily feel to them, like skin up against a, a fence or something, um, kind of pressing through. I really like the challenge of trying to make a hard material look soft. Um, mm. And so I guess that's the first part of it. Um, I guess another aspect that I think about, um, I think a lot in pairs, and um, that kind of um, like two objects that are alike but not exactly the same, and how that kind of relates to um, like feminism and queerness um, is something that I think is really important to me. Um, so I think that the work has become like way more abstract conceptually. Um, but that I still try and hold on to um, little bits of um, those original themes. Uh, and I guess even if it's not totally present in the work, but I'm still making with that intention, that's okay with me. Good. <laughs> um, Mark asks, have you ever thought of combining your sculptural forms into functional furniture pieces? Great question, Mark. <laughs> I have. Everyone asks if these two, if this piece particularly, um, if they're stools. Uh, mm -hmm. And as as it is now, they're not. It would not be a study to sit on. Um, but eventually, I could see myself like, yeah, putting a bottom on it. I I like the idea of sculptural furniture. Um, I find whenever I set out to make something functional, I kind of lose interest halfway mm -hmm. through. Um, but if I'm making like more sculptural functional work, then I, that would excite me too. Cool. That's interesting that you lose, like if it serves a purpose, like it, like made, like a functional purpose, then it just like loses, 
No, I'm not. I'm not <laughs> um, Christina asks, uh, I understand that in the last sculpture, the grid is bronze. Are the blonde legs hand cut or carved wood? Those are carved wood, um, carved by hand. Um, can you see these questions? Let's see. Um, Jerome asks, by using Rhino, did that technology give you greater creativity in doing your work? Um, and, but what materials were you focused on? Um, I think that it has given me greater creativity. Um, it allows me, I, I'm really not a 2D person, like I have a hard time drawing um, and cr like cre creating something flat that is three-dimensional. So Rhino is, I, as soon as I started using it, I found it to be really intuitive um, for me. And um, I like it because I can see something in the round. It also kind of adds this extra challenge um, that I think a lot of 3D artists love, like the problem solving aspect of something. And so like trying to figure out how to model something in Rhino is like a whole other problem than to try and figure out how to make it. And again, I think like, as I'm thinking about it in Rhino, I start to think about how I would output it or like create it by hand. So that's something that's really exciting. And um, I would say like in terms of digital fabrication and material, I'm most focused um, carving wood on the CNC router. Um, and that's just because wood, I would say, is like my, my love, my favorite material to work with. Um, and I, the, the CNC is like a, a great tool for that. Um, awesome. Andrea asks another question. Uh, can you talk about your attention to craft as you explore conceptual ideas? Yeah, I think um, craft has always been a really important um, thing to me, kind of going back to that original idea of um, form and material are equal to concept. Like, it was r really ingrained in me that I have to be able to create a believable object um, for my viewers in order to be like a successful artist. And maybe that's not true for everyone, but um, I've always really loved being in the shop and have a really shop intensive practice. Um, and I, that was true at RISD, but even more so since coming to Anderson Ranch, which is such a, a craft intensive school. Um, like working in the wood shop along with furniture designers, like I'm the only, one of the only sculptors working in the wood shop. And so I'm constantly influenced by like the high quality that I see in there. Um, and I think, I think just the importance of craft is that I, I want to make something that, um, that like will hold up to an imagination. Like I want it to be a believable object. Yeah. Um, Steve asked, did you see the Francesca Woodman prints at RISD? Yeah, those were definitely very influential um, to the grid, the grid photographs. Yeah. Um, so Jerome asked another question, what medium do you usually use and why? Um, I, I usually use wood. Um, I like to carve wood. I like to fabricate with it. Um, I like the challenge that it faces. Uh, a lot of times I bend wood, which is, um, can be a finicky thing. Um, and I like the softness of the material. Cool. Um, I'm gonna, I'm gonna let Dell ask his question in person. He, um, he has a good question that he can explain maybe. Mm -hmm. Del, are you there? Maybe now? Yeah, I can hear you. Oh, awesome. <laughs> Hi, guys. Hi, Leah. Hi, Del. So great to see your work. I, I haven't seen that much of it before. Um, I feel like I've just seen bits and pieces, but it was super inspiring. Um, so thank you. Um, and thanks for inviting me. Um, I guess my question was, I, I, I actually have a lot of questions, but um, maybe, maybe to start with, you know, you talked about the grid in a few different ways. And um, 
you know, you kind of started out by talking about it as this kind of neutral thing. And then you started talking, you spoke about like the emotional states that these gridded spaces create. Um, and then you talked about it through the association with the seaplane and digital space. And I found it so strange that in your work, actually all of these sort of contradictory ideas um, felt really true of the grid. And I was just wondering if there were other themes or ideas or emotions um, kind of specifically that you associate with the grid. Um, you know, I was thinking about ideas of like pressure and resistance, um, but I was just wondering if you could talk more about that. Yeah, um, I feel like I'm still really figuring it out. Uh, I guess like the first word that comes to mind for thinking about the grid in relation to me is just obsession. Um, and it's something that I think like as an artist, if you're still confused by something or obsessed with something, like you should keep going with that idea. And so I guess it still brings me a lot of confusion, but um, yeah, I mean, I think about structure, I think about it um, primarily like seeing grids out in the world and how, how they um, are like a structural element to so many different things. Um, but I, w I guess I would say like it's kind of a non-answer, but I'm still really thinking about it and just trying to like explore all of the the different ways um, in which I can use it and the different associations that it might bring. And I think because it is kind of this neutral thing in a way, like it just does allow me to kind of project whatever I need to project onto it at the moment um, and can like be abstract enough to to take on a number of different meanings. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks, Del. Yeah. Um, so we have a couple of the questions that uh, we will get through. Um, Deb Rosenbaum asked another one. What are the dimensions of the last piece? They suggest a stool form. Um, have you designed any furniture? Um, I know that we kind of talked about that a minute for a second, but like, have you designed furniture outside of like your conceptual work? And um, this might, she says that this might link up your bodily interests maybe? Yeah, that's true. Um, I guess I can, I'm looking at the questions now and can kind of answer a few of them um, together. So the dimensions of this piece, uh, it's about maybe 20 inches tall and then each grid um let's go back to that oops no there we go <laughs> um each of these are about 12 inches uh in either dimension um and sorry i'm just going to close out of this so i can see more easily the q a um you can Stop sharing your screen if you want, and then you can see the questions probably a little easier. Okay, sounds good. There we go. Um, all right, so I guess, yeah, these definitely suggest um, stools. Uh, and I haven't really designed furniture intentionally. I've like made a bookshelf for my apartment and made a stool and that kind of thing. Um, but it, I guess it's more, uh, I'm definitely more fo focused on sculpture and non-functional things. And then if I can integrate sculpture into something functional, then that's fine too. Um, but I guess, I don't know. I, I, it's just what I like to do. I just prefer it. I don't know if there's like a very specific answer for that. Um, and I guess just to tie in a few of these things, um, if like my, some of my work is for sale, I've thrown a lot of things away, unfortunately, um, over the course of my artistic <laughs> career. Uh, since being at the ranch, I've been working much smaller than I was in school. Um, but uh, you can see more of my work that I didn't show here on my website. It's just leahagater.com, my name.com. Um, yeah, uh, I guess, David Kimball Anderson has the question and we'll also let him ask it live. Um, can you give yeah. him? David, are you there? 
Can you hear me? Yeah, we yes. can hear you. Okay. Um, Leah, uh, per our earlier conversation uh, regarding uh, today's event and, and the work, um, I'll, I'll just read my question because, because I'm nervous. Um, okay, are the works that address intimacy made from a private space or do you feel engaged with your audience when making them? Meaning, are they private or public? And does allowing them to be exhibited change your relationship to them? And meaning change your relationship to the pieces? That's a really great question. Um, I actually do prefer to work in a private space um, just because that's what I'm more comfortable with. I think like I, when I was in school, I was doing like a lot of body casting and that kind of thing. So I need, did need a more private space, but I'm also used to working in um, communal settings. Like I share a studio with Mark, which is awesome. Um, but I, I would say that like I have a hesitation to talking about the work while I'm making it. Um, like it does feel really like I have a deep intimacy with the, whatever I'm creating at the time and kind of feel like maybe wrongly, like other people shouldn't be allowed into that just yet. Um, and I've become a lot more comfortable um, in the last year or two with with showing my work and talking about it. Um, and I, I mean, I do love to watch people interact with it. Um, a lot of people try and touch it, which is interesting and um, sometimes fine. But um, I guess like they're both private and public with regards to intimacy. Like I think that because maybe my con like the concepts or the intentions that I put into making my objects don't always show through successfully that that I still like retain some sort of like secret or intimacy with that particular work mm -hmm. um, at, and that like the public sees something else in it and like I said earlier in my talk like because things are so abstract that I make um, I do want people to like have their own relationship with it and kind of see what they need to see within it in order uh, rather than giving them a specific message. Mm -hmm. Cool. Um, do you want to move on to the next question? Thanks, David, for hopping on. Yeah. Sure. Maybe we'll just do like three more questions. Yeah, sure. All right. So this one's from Chris. He says, I think it's really interesting that you went from digital to hand. What about the relationship going forward in your work? Um, or that relationship going forward in your work. Uh, it's definitely something that I'm interested in continuing. Um, I really liked it for the problem solving aspect of it. Um, but I also just think that like the things that I can create by hand are so different than the things that I can create on the computer and vice versa. Like it would actually be interesting to, to try and 3D model, like retrospect, retroactively 3D model one of my sculptures because that would end up being like really different than the original thing. So yeah, I'm really interested in that translation um, of digital to physical and back again. Let's see. Sophia asks, do you um, balance having your body slash, slash images and representations of human models with creating abstract work and objects not found in their reality? Um, I would say maybe earlier in my work I did, I don't know if, I think I'm kind of just moving away from using the body at all. Um, but I think at the, at the beginning, yeah, I kind of like took a, a large shift to become more abstract because I wanted to get away from using the body. Um, all right. And then the last one is from Lauren. Do you consider your process performative? Why or why not? Your decision to work with your hands feels intention, uh, intentional to involve your body. Um, I, I don't think of my, my practice as, uh, or my process as performative. Um, I think it's, that's probably just because I've always been making um, three-dimensionally 
and maybe like being in the studio just feels like second nature and like working on machines and that kind of thing um and because like it is a, a fairly like personal experience that i have have with the work um but i guess i do like really could consider the the hand quality in my objects um and that is definitely evidence of me in the work which is something that I appreciate um, and that I think my work demands because like as you saw in some of the sculptures like when it's so far removed it um, it just doesn't really have like that same emotional quality that that the work that's made by hand does but I mean there are certain sculptures that are like the um, the one with the the wood pushing through the metal grid the first one of those um, like that was made both by hand and using digital fabrication, like on the CNC router. So there are like elements of both within them. But yeah, I would say for the most part, I don't find my practice super performative. That's a great question. Cause you do have like some performance in your work, but yeah. yeah. Awesome. Well, thanks so much for sharing your work with you. We, really, we, uh, we appreciate it. And by all these great questions, I feel like everyone else did too. Um, yeah. So just a, re a reminder again, next week we are doing this again on Tuesday at four, but even before then we have our Thinker Thursday, which um, will be Thursday at four o'clock. Please RSVP just like you did, um, or register just like you did for this event. The link is on the website. Um, we are looking forward to having some amazing people uh, present. We have uh, Ed Kashi, who's a, an amazing photojournalist. He will be presenting. Uh, Zakria, our very own studio coordinator of sculpture, will be presenting. We'll have a lot of great people um, sharing some really cool things. So we hope that you guys will certainly join us for that as well. And then also again next Tuesday, and uh, Lou will be sharing her work, our studio coordinator of ceramics. So we're excited about that. Um, but just keep looking at our website for all those links and more information. Um, we're really trying to keep our community strong and having all these virtual events um, and uh, trying to keep our community together and informed and, um, you know, just getting through this, this COVID moment. Um, but thanks so much for attending and um, we look forward to seeing you guys on Thursday. So and thank just you. one more thing, if you yeah. have any other questions for me, feel free to email me. I'm putting my email on the list. And also, if you are interested in signing up for any digital fabrication workshops, please get in touch with me because we'd love to have you at the ranch. Awesome. Thanks so much, Leah. Thanks, everyone. Bye. Bye, guys.